welcome to Tampa Home Talk. I'm your host, Katrina Madewell, with my favorite two co-hosts, Mr. Leo King with Barrel Engineering and Inspections. Well, good morning. I've got a zinger for you in the segment, too. I can't <laughs> wait to release. And Adam Talley. Oh, good morning. With Talley Insurance. Good to be, it's good to be Good here. morning. It's good to be back. Okay. I feel like we haven't been together as a, as a like, have, yeah, trio Yeah, somebody's been missing. <laughs> Happy birthday, y'all. Oh, yeah. It's coming. Like, we're all right around the corner here. All three of us have the same little birthday hubs. Anyway, uh, buckle up, y'all, because this is going to be a show. Okay. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're, uh, we're going to hit the soapbox, I think, today. But um, it's in the news. I can't not talk about it, right? Anything related to real estate, we cover. You guys know, right? We definitely talk about it here. Not everything. Uh, darn near. We cover a lot of it. I think this one's a, a big one. This one's oh, you're going to talk about that NAR ruling? NAR, NAR, NAR. Oh, yeah. yeah, the NAR ruling. Yeah, I bumped our guest, actually, this week to talk about the NAR ruling. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'm a little confused about it. I mean... Oh, we're going to talk about it. Let's cover the numbers for the week. Yes, let's cover the numbers. And then we'll talk about that, and we won't miss the dad joke. Of the I, week. Wish, I wish we could have a, um, a lawyer on the show for this. I, I can speak to a lot of it. Yeah. Not a, an attorney, but I can I can tell you I'm very I've been following it since day one. I've been and I can give you a lot of the backstory. So too. basically, yesterday our company was presenting at Pro, which is the Pinellas Realtor Organization. We were presenting on Senate Bill 4D and 154, which is the real estate, um, which is the reserve study mm -hmm. and the structural inspections for tall buildings. Uh, we were presenting on that, and they specifically said at the beginning they weren't going to answer any questions about the NAR ruling. And of course, every third or fourth question, they tried to swipe a question in because you had 200 real estate agents in the office. Just well, as a and, I, and I think that's crazy. Like, why would you not talk about it? And that, the, so I'm going to, well, I'll the, address that. The reason why we didn't want to talk about it is we were there for a completely different topic and it. it was a scheduled session. I get it. Yeah. You and want Barrel to have the floor. That's why they're there. And just as a teaser for this NAR ruling, it has to deal with real estate commissions. So it I does. I want to bring that out to the listening audience. So after we get to the numbers, we're going to find out there was a ruling that went against real estate agents and brokerages over commission. So I'm actually excited to talk about it. Well, there's a lot. I know people have a lot of questions, right? So the purpose of, course, of this show I is have to... questions. For yeah. Sure. So we're going to talk about all of those. We're going to talk about what it is. Like, what is it even all about? What's happening now? What might happen in our industry as a whole? So I'll give you my predictions, right? Which I'm pretty good at. And... Um, We'll talk about what I think is going to change. So we'll we'll dive into that in a second. So let's talk about the number of new listings. And we have last week right here, Leo, if you want to compare them side by side. But this week, new listings are coming in at 775. Price decrease is coming in at a sharp 1206. Solds are coming in at 777. And the number of pendings are coming in at 639. So when we compare that to last week, we're about the same. Price decreases are on a sharper incline. But other than that, the rest of the numbers are about even with each other. Um, we are looking in a situation as we continue to get towards the balanced market where the number of new listings is outpacing pendings. Slightly. I mean, it's still it's just a slight thing. But when we take a look at a look at the sharp decrease in the price decreases, which by the way are still listings, they're just not counted in that top number because they're not new listings in the first seven days. No, they're still listings. Um, that that's important too. The other thing to keep in mind: this doesn't take into account condominiums and the market Correct. on condominiums or townhomes or mobile homes yeah. or dirt. And, and basically, because of the Senate Bill 4D and 154 Reserve Study milestone part. Not only has the market kind of bottomed out for condos, making them really tough to sell, um, lenders right now, from what we understand and what we learned yesterday, lenders don't even want to touch these buildings if they're required to have these inspections if the inspections haven't been done. 100% sure that has to be accurate. We could verify that with Sarah Cricky, but that sounds right on point to me. That was one of the topics yeah. we covered. And unfortunately, if your building fails the phase one... Oh, you're done. You're not getting along. You, you <laughs> basically... All funding is stopped now for six to eight months, from what I understand. I'm sure. Can you give a refresher on what you've been doing for these buildings? So basically with these buildings, what we have is you're required to have a reserve study, which is basically a capital improvement plan on how you're going to maintain the building and fund that maintenance plan for the building. So there's no Surfside collapses. So there's no collapses. Before. We've had a collapse in Surfside, which is in Miami. We had a collapse in Jacksonville. So they are taking this very seriously. And in conjunction with that uh, capital improvement table or reserve study, they want a structural inspection of the building to see how damaged it is or isn't. It makes sense to me. I mean, I think they should. I think it's a good rule. It's going to cost a lot of money, and you can't 
have these shabby projects that are like you can't have a lot of deferred maintenance in a condo where what, a lot of what people size, are what size building um are they looking at they're basically any building that's three or more stories that's 25 or 30 years or older they say 25 or 30 because some places it's 25 and some places it's 30 is it lower on the coast i'm guessing anywhere in the state of florida so if your building is 30 years old and three stories or taller and happens to be a condominium you're subject to this well what i'm saying is what's the difference between the 30 and the 25 the municipalities. Um, last, when the bill first came out, it was if you were in certain distance to the coast, you were 25, and if you were further away, you were 30. They revised it this year to just be 30 across the whole board, but some governments still said, hey, we're still doing the 25. Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. And so, and it, well, that would make sense because some municipalities may have tighter rules, right, around building. So they, if, if you look at some more rural areas of the state, their building codes might not have been as stringent as you know and just to let Miami, just right? to let the audience know about how scary this can be for some of these HOAs is if you are poorly maintained or you are poorly um, reserved we're hearing special assessments in the tune of 50 to up to two hundred thousand yeah. dollars per unit yeah that's gonna it's gonna bankrupt some people thousand yeah. two hundred thousand sometimes unit. they might not even be worth that oh plus there was the another lawsuit down in Bayshore uh, there was the Bayshore condominiums um, one, I forget the exact name, but it was like they ended up with a forty-three million dollar construction bill that they had to special assess their their owners for, and they're all, that that turned into a lawsuit because no one could afford it. But at the same time, you're fighting against this the the building needs to work. So yeah. it's kind of like they they went for years, basically. And what we're seeing a lot of is when you have tile on your balcony, and then you have railings, and it's not properly installed and not properly waterproofed. That's all going to rust out and cause cause damage where the balcony could collapse. And we're seeing that a lot. So the, my number one advice for you, if you are on the board of a condominium and you have balconies, prevent your unit owners from putting tile on them. Mm, that makes sense. That's your tip of the week. What um, <laughs> tip, tip of the week. Do not put tile on your balcony. Well, from an engineering perspective, well, what are you seeing that la is more sustainable long term? Uh, it, most of these buildings are just going to start off just being concrete. Okay. Um, if they're going to have anything, uh, a, a textured um, waterproofing coating, you know, like you would have for those garages, like those new garages. An epoxy in the, or epoxy a flat roof. or something. But no tile. Uh, make sure you're keeping up your painting and waterproofing. I mean, that, that most of the failures we're seeing, and they're not technically failures, most of the need for further investigations yeah. that we're seeing are coming from the balconies and walkways with the lack of maintenance and waterproofing. It's, it's the same thing over and over again. But the water gets in through the grout, which is porous, and it sits there underneath the tile and causes the rebar to swell and the next thing you know um, you've got structural damage that uh, nobody can see yeah and does it get to the point of like Leo can see that's no, what they can see yes does it get to the point doctor, of doctor dr can does it get to the point of structural collapse like we have at surfside surfside when you take a look at that one it was a combination of 20 years of deferred maintenance plus the building was built wrong Oof. the building was they, they like they, it's amazing when you take a look at surfside and you see like they ran out of money, so they fired the contractor, hired a new one. They decided to pour the footings, which are like the things keeping the building up. The most important thing. It's the foundation. They, they poured them half-sized. And then they, they came up with an idea to add a floor to, to sell more units. Which and, is more weight. Not and, good. And if you look at the collapse, if you look at the video of the collapse, you can see that area that they shortchanged the footers and added the floor. That's the piece that goes first. Oof. Painful. Yeah, it was very, painful. very painful. All right, let's dive in. That's enough of 4D yes. for the moment. We'll oh. talk but about the, it again. I, so the numbers well, here... I'm stressed out myself right now. So I don't live in a condo. What I would love to do, if we can, next week, let's take a look at condo numbers. Okay. Let's let's pull specifically condo numbers. Let's take a look at how... That sounds good. We'll talk HO6s. Yeah, we can talk HO6 policies, HO3s, HO8s. We can talk all about the different HOs. <laughs> I think we had a veteran show planned, but we'll figure something out. Uh, we we'll make just, half of it at least. Well, we show. can just talk about condos for the numbers. Oh, and then yeah. Veterans Day next week. Yeah, it is we'll Veterans Day. We'll talk about Day. it. All right, so let's dive into this. So first of all, it's important to keep in mind this is a Missouri ruling, right? We're in Florida. Yes. Missouri ruling. Is it going to affect things everywhere? I think so. At some point. I don't know when. It's, is it immediate? No, it's not. So what I've seen in other rulings, just in general, because we're dealing with some of this on the engineering forensic side, when there is a ruling and it's gone to an appellate court and it's either up, uh, upheld or overturned, especially if it's overturned, those are the big ones. If it goes to an appellate court and it's overturned, there's this huge pendulum of fear that goes in one direction or the other. So 
Um, if if it if it gets to an appellate court and it was overturned and it's in your favor, the pendulum of fear is away from you and you just go gangbusters with it. But if it's against you, that pendulum of fear now has all these lawyers second guessing themselves or figuring out around it or find trying to find other case law saying, well, this case says A, A B, and C, but our case says D, E, and F, and they're not related. And that's that pendulum yeah. of fear moving. So this this NAR ruling is just a normal court. It's not an appellate. Right. Okay. So. Yeah. So it's, well, it's important to under, some people probably don't even know, because like the questions I've got in the last few days and like this morning on the way here at a client say, hey, did you see that right up in the paper? No, I didn't, but I already know what it's about. So <laughs> we're going to talk about it. I'm like, tune in. We're going to talk about it in depth. So the Missouri jury basically found realtors and other brokerages, right, including Keller Williams. Remax was in there. They pulled out and settled early. There was a bunch of other ones. Um, they found uh, basically NAR, National Association of Realtors, a couple other brokerages guilty of conspiring to inflate commissions. Okay, so there you go ahead and ask your question. Uh, well, okay, well, I just like okay. My biggest problem from all of this, okay, is you signed a contract that states what the commission is, didn't yeah. you? So then, and you, you have a choice. You signed a, and you have a choice. And they're not all the same. Exactly. You as a realtor have a choice. Everybody has a choice. Like I have a real problem with signing with somebody signing a contract and then being like, oh, well, I didn't know. Well, do do you not have the ability to read? <laughs> if you don't, then you shouldn't have signed the contract. And this came up yesterday in our presentation. The whole, Sorry, that really rubs me. No, no. This came up yesterday in the presentation, and this is this is directly relevant to what Adam just said. The realtors are talking about the fact that they're sending over disclosures or, or, or documents via DocuSign, 18, 20, 25 pages. And literally from the time they send the email to the time they get the, your client has signed this paperwork, 45, 60 seconds. That might be true. And what you don't see is the fact that people like me are going to review it in paper form before they ever get it on DocuSign. Right. Right. And then I have some agents on my team that will sign it electronically on an iPad. So, you know, you don't have any of that data in that stuff. So there's always more story or information behind the story. But I get yeah, what you're saying. No, I mean, you can't you'd be upset about a contract that you signed but didn't read. That was your choice right. not to read it. So let's talk about this. Like, or, what, or what are, does, you saying, are you saying that they're leading them with DocuSign because it's so easy as opposed to it. walking No, no, what I'm through. saying is it's clear cut that these people aren't reading the contracts they're signed. I was agreeing. They're just not reading the contracts they signed and how important is well, it? Whose so right. fault is them not reading the contract? So there are certain things that the Florida... <laughs> My, where my yeah, question no, no, is, it's, like, it's actually as somebody that writes contracts for insurance every day. It's it, the it, biggest it's lie in America. The biggest lie in America is I have read and understood these the terms. terms and agreements. <laughs> like, like even when I'm playing a video game, I started playing Assassin's Creed Mirage a couple of weeks ago because it came out. Fun game. I love Assassin's Creed. <laughs> and to play the game, I got like. 20 page EULA, which is a, a, Did you a, read it? <laughs> an end user license agreement. I just want to play the game. Exactly. So you, they force you to scroll through the whole thing. I didn't read it. I'm never going to read it. I just want to play my game. That's the rest <laughs> this is my it reads like 30 game. pages a minute, you know. So how's yeah. how's everybody else reading the contract that fast? All right. So I hear the music coming in. We got to take a break, but we're going to dive on this into this uh, in depth when we come back after the break. And uh, I'll talk about what this is about and how I think things are going to go in the industry as a whole. And uh, it was a two week deliberation and the jury deliberated on it for almost three hours before they came to a decision so it wasn't a five minute trial or a one day trial it was it was two weeks but we'll talk about that and some other information when we come back 813-377-2775 if you want some direct information you want to know how this impacts you or how things might change we're going to cover it but you can call or text if you have more questions 813-377-2775 <laughs> Welcome home. This is Leo Kane with Barrel Engineering and Inspection, bringing you breaking news because we are breaking the real estate market. We are breaking the real estate world, and it's all thanks to Missouri. <laughs> and you do not pronounce the I when you say Missouri. Okay, thank you. I'm not from the Midwest. If you're, well, if you're from Missouri, you definitely say Missouri for sure. I went to high school in Missouri, so I say Missouri. Oh, you did? <laughs> okay, you say, you say Missouri. I'll say Missouri. Yeah, the, the, and the other thing that people commonly mispronounce is Louisville. <laughs> 
That's it's like there's a lot of cities in uh, Tennessee that are the same way. <laughs> if you're from there, you're going to say it completely different. All right. So let's talk about this. So it talks about like what's the premise of the lawsuit, right? Like what's what's the premise of it? And I would say there's two prongs to this, right? So they're saying that basically uh, realtors and brokerages um, conspired to keep commissions higher than they should be, right? So ba essentially violating antitrust law. So they're saying that all realtors charge the same no matter what, and it's a violation of antitrust, right? That's could, part of could it. Could they not pull like one of thousands of contracts oh, there's that millions uh, i mean you know what i mean well i mean it's in the state of missouri right yeah. missouri excuse me there's millions but <laughs> so that's one of them and the other one is their their argument is that um and then i'll talk about from my perspective how this really goes down but they're saying that um essentially sellers are paying uh commission um, including a portion of that commission is given to the buyer's agent so that they can negotiate against the seller. That's part of their argument, right? And I get that. They're saying, why should I have to pay a higher commission to pay the buyer's agent, which doesn't even represent me or any mm -hmm. part of my side of the transaction? And, um, you know, the, the truth is Florida Realtors has supported cooperating agent compensation, which is what this is for a hundred years because most buyers are not going to have the money to pay a real estate compensation on top of their closing costs on top of their down payment right and all of these things that that they have to pay now i'm going to turn that around and say that part of this uh, onus is on realtors for not explaining it properly because the way i explain it when i, I go into a listing is I charge X percent based on the services I'm providing, okay? And based on those services, um, here's what you're going to get, right? And we go through all the things that we do to market, list, and sell a property. Now, you're paying me that amount of money no matter how that goes down, right? That's what you're paying me to sell your home, period, mm -hmm. okay? Now, with that being said, we as realtors agree to cooperate with other agents when they have a buyer that matches our listing. And we say, sure, we'll give you a portion or half or whatever it is of that commission when you bring a buyer and you help do all the things that go into a buyer side of a real estate transaction. And there's a lot, right? So each party sort of has their own duties. And that's why I've never understood people that every, you know, pretty often I would say we'll get a, not, not often, but more commonly than not, when people ask about commissions or adjusting them, we'll get a buyer that comes directly and they'll, they'll think, oh, I'm going to take 3% or whatever percentage right off the top because that's what you were offering a buyer's agent and I'm not bringing a buyer, so I'm going to take that right off the top. And what I tell them is it has no impact on what offer the seller would accept for their home, right? Because mm -hmm. the contract between the listing broker and the seller is just that. It's, it's a contract between... Leo, you and I and, and myself and my brokerage to sell your home. And then the contract between the buyer and the seller are completely different. And those contracts have nothing to do really theoretically with each other. So with that being said, if a buyer comes to me directly and they say, hey, I want to buy your home for X dollars, great. I'm going to present that offer because it has nothing to do with our listing agreement. Like we already have an agreement on the cost to list, market, sell, your home, right? Mm -hmm. And so when a buyer comes, it's just, do you want to accept their offer or not? Because we've already agreed on these other terms. Does that make sense? It does. So this, this ruling doesn't touch on the thing that I always questioned, which was sometimes the buyer's agent and the seller's agent is the same person. And they're supposed to be negotiating on behalf of their client, but if they know what the seller is willing to sell for and the buyer is willing to buy for, it's actually at that point in the real estate agent's best interest to maximize the amount of the sale to increase their commission knowing what those two numbers are. Right. I understand what you're saying. I understand that perspective and I get why, why um, some people are you know, can feel that way. Now, every state is different, right? I don't know what the rules and the laws are in Missouri because I don't live there and I've never practiced real estate. Yay. <laughs> so Yay, I, I will tell you, <laughs> I did it intentionally just for you. I will tell you that 
um, they might allow dual agency, which is what you're talking about. I don't know if they do or they don't. I don't know because I'm not a licensed agent in that state. I just think dual agency is I, impossible I to do correctly. You can't represent the best interest in the sellers to sell the house as much as possible and the best interest of the buyers to get the house as cheap as possible. I get what you're saying, but I will tell you that I have facilitated that type of situation, I believe, successfully without giving either party any numbers or information. I have. And I'll give you a couple of examples, okay? So, because the market got heated for a while, if you remember, very limited inventory. So, we had buyers, different buyers within our own organization making offers on properties. Some of them were our listings. And so, I'll talk about how we handled that. So, dual agency for one is not allowed in the state of Florida. It doesn't exist. Almost all agents are going to operate as a transaction broker, which means they operate in the best interest of the transaction, getting all parties from A to Z successfully with terms that everybody can live with, right? That's how we operate here. Some will operate as a single agent. I personally do not. I don't think it makes sense because again, when you hire me to sell your home, you're hiring me to get that done no matter how that happens, right? For the best terms that we can get for you for price and terms that are acceptable to you, right? So the way I've handled it in the past and I've had, now I've seen other agents, right? And I don't agree with the way they're doing this. I, I had a listing before and this agent made an offer for her buyer and then came in and, and made a higher offer on her behalf that was all cash because she was buying it for her daughter. I thought that was wrong. I would not do that. I just wouldn't do it. I think it's wrong to do. But aside from that, going back to your point, Leo, with what you were saying, you could use whatever number, right? Let's use 500000 I'm selling my home for 500000 and you tell me privately, hey, I'll really take four twenty five dollars for the right offer, right? And let's say this buyer comes in and they say, I want to make a lowball offer. Can you make them an offer at 400000 and um, or, or what's the lowest number they will take? I'll get that. I'll, yeah, they'll you get say, that a lot. Of what's the lowest number the seller will take? And I'll say, I don't know. The property is listed for five hundred thousand. You know, if you tell me four twenty five, I'm not going to tell the buyer that it's not fair. And if if you if the, if you if you're saying we're pushing back and forth, we'll see if they'll take this, see if they'll take that, or I'll go here, I'll go there. I'm not going to convey any of that information to the other party because that's not fair. It gives one party or the other an unfair advantage, right? Yes. And a lot of times parties meet in the middle anyway it's just what they do it's it's considered fair negotiation right it's considered bland mediation okay whatever how okay <laughs> if it's 500 and, and you and the buyer makes an offer of 425 right and then the seller comes back and says no i want 475 it wouldn't be uncommon practice for you guys to meet in the middle at 450 unless you're doing what you should be doing as, the, as a real buyer with a real offer and you come back and say 425 because that was my offer and I've done that and negotiating may. before. Yeah. They're like, but we're, you're supposed to meet in the middle. I'm like, no, I gave you my real final offer. And they may. Got yeah. with their highest and best offer. They may. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, the seller has to make the decision. Do they want to walk away or not? You know? And I, I will tell the agent or the buyer on the other side, do they, um, do you think there's any room? I don't know. Probably not. You know, ultimately the seller gets to pick. Sellers have said, I'm not going to go below X, but... Sometimes if they want to sell their home and they've got a real offer in front of them, they may take it. Right? And there's other things you can do when you get a lower offer as a seller. You can shrink uh, inspection contingencies or have them waived. You can shrink other... You can shrink other... Um, there's other outs, points to outs, negotiate on. Outs for the contract or you can raise the escrow money, the earnest money. So if if they do end up backing out, you do get compensated for that that differential. There's, there's several things you can do if you are taking a lower offer to... Because the terms of the contract are more than just the money on the table. Correct. Yep. It's never about the money. So for me, I don't give either party any of that information. When they ask me, will the seller take a lower offer? I tell them, I don't know, because I truly don't know. The seller could change your mind, right? I don't know. It's not my house. I'm not the one signing and accepting that offer. Now, if they're asking, would the seller take a lower offer and it's my house I'm selling? I can answer that. But if it's not my home that I own, I, I truly can't answer that. I, when they ask me, will they take a low, lower offer? Well, it's listed for 500. That's the price they're willing to accept. That's what they've told me. That's where it's listed. So ultimately this ruling is about price fixing? Yes. And commission price fixing? Yes. 
So it's basically the fact that the sellers are saying it's 5% no matter what, and that's considered price fixing. I think they're saying it's 6%. And or well, it's 5 or 6 yeah. or whatever the number is. Part of the reason why they drug Gary Keller into it is because he put what they call budget models in the MREA, which is uh, the book they wrote back in the 90s, A Millionaire Real Estate Agent, because there was no other models available. And he just said if, if there were um, – if the commission was – six percent right three percent of the buyers through and just what does that look like what do the numbers look like when they're all calculated out that's all it was was a number model but the interesting thing is you go back to the 90s and an agent with our office brought this up the other day that's been around as long as me and i'm like she's right at that time most of the commissions were seven percent or more so the fact that he wrote about it in the mrea using three and three is not even a relevant point but there was a lot of stuff that they did not get to even present which is part of the argument. It's why it's going into appeals. And this is probably going to be a five-year or longer litigation. <laughs> Adam, let's hear your questions. Are you for your Welcome home. This is Tampa Home Talk. I'm Adam Talley with Talley Insurance. And we are diving right into this big uh, Missouri Right back jury in. trial uh, here. And uh, so questions. I know we left off with Leo asking if I had questions, and then we took a little bit of a break. Um, I get my main question for, from what I've kind of taken from everything that you guys have talked about last segment. How is it possible for them to group? I, I, I get the complaints that you know Leo brought up, or, or maybe just some of the points. It might not even be a complaint, but I, I get some of the things that he brought up and what you said that you do personally. So, how are no, we? That's what all realtors do. They just, I think, a lot of them fail to explain it correctly. Oh, well, hey, it, just listen. Yeah. In every industry, there's good and bad actors, so we'll right. just call it what it is. But like, how do you do it as a whole versus? I could see. Okay, maybe we had the same agent for the buyer and the seller, and maybe there was some unscrupulous stuff there, but how, how do you do it as, as a, an entire organization well, I don't, as I'm being at fault? Your question. No, he's not asking about the lawsuit. He's asking about my question on how you can possibly be a buyer's and a seller's agent and represent both's best interest. Ex right. Exactly like I just explained. Yes. I mean, the bottom line is that the sellers put pen to paper or DocuSign or whatever you want to call it and said, I will sell my house for 500000 or whatever the number is. That's the number, and you just right. Well, I guess I guess my question is, I guess, let me go back then. How are they grouping everybody together when not all the contracts are the same? It's not like That's you have a fair point. every I'm sure single it'll be part of the appeal. It's not like <laughs> every single contract in Missouri was exactly the same, and buyers agents got Missouri, three, Missouri. Excuse me, uh, go go Tigers. Um, <laughs> So, so 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 how is it? So you have different contracts, yet they're grouping it as a. So let, let me compare this again to an industry I'm very familiar with, okay. the video game industry. <laughs> and let's Christ. go back to Nintendo in the 90s, in the, late, in the early 2000s. Nintendo was sued for price fixing, which is basically what this is. Correct. It's an antitrust. It's a price yep, fixing. you're right. So Nintendo would say the manufactured suggested retail price is $50 for a video game. Mm. And every retailer out there, the Best Buys, the Circuit Cities, the... The Wolf Electronics. I'm trying to think of others that exist. Don't Wait, exist Radio now. Shack. Radio Shack. Oh, look at me. Yeah, yeah Tandy. Circuit City. Tandy. Yes. So they all basically sold the games for fifty dollars, and they they couldn't they couldn't budge from that price. And Nintendo's defense was it was a suggested retail price, and the companies were like, no, we had to sell them at fifty, and we had to do these other incentives like a ten dollar gift certificate to something else, or buy this get this free. But the price of the game had to be fifty dollars, and that was considered price fixing. And if you take a look at it, did and they it, lose that, or do you know? Oh, they lost it. Okay. And if you, I'm just, I want to. Yeah, they the they, they lost it. Okay. So if now if we compare that based on antitrust, right? Antitrust. Okay. Now if we compare that to what's happening in Missouri, where they're saying that all commissions are six percent. So Keller wrote a book back in the '90s saying you're suggested. It wasn't even suggested. It was the model. Potential model could be six percent. And then everyone adopted it, and then it became the normal, and then everyone was using it. It became the standard. You have, in essence, fixed your price, and that, that is going to be a basis by which they're going to pursue this. It's no different than why companies like Xerox 
and like a Coca-Cola, spend so much money protecting their brands. They don't want their brands to become ubiquitous where they lose their trademark. So what's happening there is uh, Coke would send people to different restaurants and if they had Pepsi on tap and they asked for a Coke and if they weren't corrected, they would sue the restaurant. Mm. And that was to protect themselves from this kind of like something so common, it becomes the pro it, it, it loses a proper noun and just becomes a noun. So all soda was now Coke. Coke Cola no longer had a trademark, and that caused damage. So on the price fixing side, if everyone's using six percent, whether or not Keller intended it to be, but if everyone's using six percent, then that is a basis for trust busting. It but had not nothing. Everybody's using six percent though. Not. I guess and that's, a, had, that's my problem. It had that's nothing my to rub. do with them. That's and, my and rub. Even Gary Keller responded to it saying that they don't tell their agents what to charge they could charge whatever i mean i can tell you if i sell vacant land it is nowhere near six percent it's higher it's more work it's more work for less money yeah and there's there's times that i haven't taken anything right because i want that seller to move to the finish line i mean it, it to say that every party charges the same always no matter what is not fair and it's not true it's not and so if you if you if you want to be real about this with antitrust and price fiction, let's let's talk about collusion and extortion between NAR taking our all of our data and intellectual property and selling it to other people for no royalties. I mean, why aren't they being sued? That's like taking all the parts of my book that I spent months writing, giving it away or other people making money off of it, and I get nothing from it. I get no royalties. I get nothing. But it's my intellectual property. Well, you get the That's defense funny. of the lobbyist group. I mean, they're a huge lobbyist group. And uh, like, like I said, Lynn, earlier we were talking about is there, so there's a ruling, then it goes to appellate court, and then it'll go to Supreme Court. NAR is such a big lobbyist group. They can force this all the way up to the top if the rulings don't come out in their favor. Well, and they will, and they should. Um, but I, I think this is probably going to reshape the way our industry operates as a whole. How so? Um, because I think there's a good chance that buyer agent compensation and the co-op commission is going to go away. So basically, or, or not be what it is today at a minimum, right? So for example, let's just say it is half and it isn't always half, but let's say it is six and it is half at three to a buyer agent. Um, essentially, that part will go away. Right. So as and a buyer, all, am I going to have to pay my own buyer's agent? Yeah, that's what I think is going to happen. So now, like you said, back to your point about NAR being a big lobbyist group, they're already ahead of this. They're already meeting with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all of those to increase the maximum seller contribution because there's caps mm -hmm. on how much a seller can pay based on you know the type of loan it is and that sort of stuff. So they're looking at increasing those by, by quite a bit you know, on all of them across the board, because what's going to happen is it then, it then it gives sellers the choice, right? Which I don't think is a bad way to do it. I think buyer's agents have to work on a, uh, a, a buyer agency agreement, right? That for whatever percentage or amount or flat fee they're charging. And then essentially the buyer will either pay it directly or they will ask for seller paid closing costs, and that can be a closing cost. So now it's, that's the way I see it in the future. Let's let's flip this to um, new construction, new subdivisions, some of your box builders. You show up to their models. You buy a new construction that's not yet built. You get to say you get to have some say in its fixtures and finishes. Um, you're using their lender because they you get more incentives to use their lender. You're using their seller's agent. Mm -hmm. You don't really need a buyer's agent to make this transaction happen. You can just use an attorney. So I can see in that sense, if it's like the seller agent is 6% or 4% and they're splitting it with a buyer's agent, your buyer technically can just use one of their friends who's a real estate agent and gift them money at that point because the buyer's agent's not doing anything in that transaction. So if there was a way that money could actually come back to the buyer, yeah. And lower the cost, it would be more beneficial. I mean, that's the perception, right? If someone goes and buys new construction, they're not doing anything. But I can tell you, we represent a lot of buyers and we are. So part of the value that we're bringing as realtors in that, in that using that same example, right? They want to buy new construction. Part of that is being familiar with the inventory 
and the area, right? So you're trying, let's say they move from out of state. You have to get an idea what their lifestyle is like to suggest some areas that they might want to live, right? If they tell you they're used to trails, they want to walk on trails or they want to be near the beach or whatever it is, you might suggest some areas based on what they've said they like or, and how they live. And so even if you didn't, they were exploring all of the areas, you would have to be familiar with all the builders, their inventory, their prices, what they offer. You know, if the seller says, I want, you know, I need four bedrooms and at least three baths with a three car garage and I need at least two bedrooms downstairs, right? You're, you're gonna have to search through all the inventory and be familiar with that. And then not only do you take the buyer to that, um, but you're helping them through all the details along the way, right? Well, that's different than I show up to the sales center. I happen to be like, I, I, I think of it like I go to the I go to the new car lot. I want to buy a 2024, insert brand name and model name here. I, I don't need a buyer's agent. I know I'm there to buy a specific type of vehicle. And I mean, I don't have a buyer's agent when I'm going to shop for vehicles and other commission-based sales. So, I mean, but, I'm just trying but to... But you're also comparing an apple to a banana. Uh, they're both fruit. <laughs> you're comparing a depreciating asset to an appreciating asset that is, has a substantial difference in price. Hey, I, I'm not saying I disagree with you, and I don't disagree with you at all. I'm just trying to come up with the craziness that was going on in the minds of the jury who found in favor yeah. of the... Uh, the, the, the plaintiffs here in the class action. Well, I'm just trying to come up with different ideas that they could have possibly fathomed to support right. such a crazy ruling. And I, and I think, you know, going back to what you're saying, Leo, with regards to the buyers going in directly to the builders, sure, you can, but do you think they're going to tell you about any of their building defects? No, they work for the builder. But the real estate agent's not going to be able to tell you about the building defects. That's where Barrel comes in. <laughs> but they're, they're real, the buyer's agent is going to suggest a company <laughs> like Barrel so they can do those multiple right. inspections during construction so they know what they're buying. Because once it's all put together, Together and the walls are up, you can see less at that point. You know, that, that kind of reminds me. Do you know why the uh, Middle Ages was also referred to as the Dark Ages? Do tell. Because it was overrun with knights. <laughs> I love it. I love the dad jokes. It's definitely part of the fun. For sure. Zinger. So anyway, <laughs> so that's that's how I think things are going no to... No comment on that one. Awesome. Yeah, we're yeah. not going to go down that rabbit hole. Thank you. I, th I think um, that's how I think that things are going to change. That best. So one more point I'd like to make <laughs> on this, like going back to this. Remember I told you you're going to pay me whatever I charge to find the buyer no matter how that goes down. Right. So part of that is public marketing right? It's in the way the listing is set up. You guys have heard me talk about that a million times on the air. A lot of our time is spent preloaded in the preparation, getting the home ready for market, making sure it shows well, making sure the photos are on point, making sure the description is something that a buyer would want to buy. Let me tell you, your descriptions sell properties. They no, they do. definitely do. So we have to spend a lot of time in there getting the buyer all the information they need and making sure that it's there. And then on top of that, selling it to the general public, we also have to sell it to other realtors so that they bring their buyers. That's where the idea behind cooperating compensation came into play. I have a, a follow-up question here. So obviously you've made some really good points as to why, you know, this probably when it does get appealed, it... Oh, you know, it's definitely it, going to be appealed. It'll definitely be appealed. I would obviously. be shocked. Uh, to, uh, well, I don't know how it's going to come out, but it'll definitely be appealed. Okay. Uh, so as, as it, filed. As it, let's just say it, as it climbs the ladder through the appellate courts, you know, but... What is the effect going to be if the ruling at the end stays the same? I think it's going to be exactly what I described. Okay. I think buyers are going to be responsible for paying their buyer agent directly. Okay. And if the buyer doesn't have the money, they're going to have to have the skill set to negotiate that into the offer with the seller. So ultimately, that's going to hurt the public. Generally, it's going to hurt the public. Um, I don't know. I mean, know. if I have to pay the buyer's agent directly and I'm still paying the could, seller, because yeah. it's going to be like anything else. I'm still going to have to pay 5 or 6% to the seller, but now I have to come up with an additional 3% that's, at closing to give the buyer. That's NAR's point, right, is that it will hurt the general public and the consumer. That's their point. Um, but I think at, at the end of the day, it's going to make true professional realtors and real estate agents sharpen their skill set. But now if I'm a buyer, I now have to negotiate the commissions right. of these agents on top of the purchase price. It's going to muddy the waters to an nth degree. Yeah, it, it may, for sure. It may. We don't know how it's going to shake out, and we got a lot of time before we find out. But what I can tell you for sure is we're still going to be here representing clients' best interests. We'll be back in a moment.
Welcome home. This is our fourth segment, my favorite part of the segment, because we have the Barrel Engineering Sponsored Listings. We're going to talk about that. Oh, no, but not that sponsored listing, sponsored open houses. Do we have an open house? I, I think so, but I don't have that data. You can text me or call me and I'll give it to you. Yeah, and we don't actually sponsor the open house. We sponsor the announcement of the open house. Okay. And we'll say if you want more information about any of these listings. Or when they're open. 813-377-2775. That's 813-377-2775. Call or text. Now, before we jump in to the Barrel Project Engineering sponsored announcement of the Keller Williams listings, you had some comments or questions? I do. I have one more final comment I want to make, right? You're talking about how this ruling, if it were to stay all the way to the Supreme Court, how it could hurt the general consumer. Oh, definitely. Definitely would hurt the general consumer. I think you're always going to have, like in any industry, right? I'll use attorneys, for example. And this would be great. You would hire an attorney to negotiate your commissions. So you've just added a cost there. It's not even what I was going to say at all. Yeah, but I mean, that's what you should do at that point. You would hire an attorney in your real estate transaction to help negotiate the costs. That I don't know that that's a good answer, but okay. Yeah. That's not where I was going. Could what save I, you what, money. So what I was going to say is, if, if anybody that has ever been party to a lawsuit, right? Especially <sighs> if you've had to defend yourself <sighs> in a lawsuit, you're not going to hire the cheapest attorney you can get. You understand the value of a good attorney. They're going to charge a little bit more. They're going to be uber familiar with the statute of whatever you're talking about, especially if they specialize in that area of law. And they're not all the same, right? Attorneys are not all the same. Just like real estate pros are not all the same. Oh. And so I think you pay for what you get. And then, let me tell you, during, remember when the market was so crazy before, like a year or so ago? Yeah. And buyers were paying thirty, fifty thousand or more above the list price. And that's what led to these lawsuits. Part of it, yeah. but so think about that. If you, we had agents within our team that the buyers agreed to pay directly. They said, "I will pay you a commission." They agreed on the amount. If you will go find me a house, so their job was to go find inventory that wasn't on the market, so that buyer didn't have to compete against multiple offers, and um, they negotiated for the buyer's best interest, and a lot of times the seller paid for it. Okay. If not, it was still cheaper than paying a hundred thousand above list price. No, I'll agree to that, but I want to throw one more flip side on that equation. I'm a middle-aged woman. I'm in my 30s, 40s. I spend two or three hours a night on Zillow because I'm secretly dying on the inside. I find the house that I want. I don't need, I could use the cheapest buyer's agent imaginable because I'm doing all my own research. I'm doing everything online right. to find the home. I just need someone in my corner that can send a sheet of paper over to the seller's agent. That's the flip side of it. That's what I think a lot of the general consumers think a buyer's agent does. They think that they open doors and they pre-fill in contracts. And the, the bottom line is a good buyer's agent is not doing that at all. But at all. They're doing a full-on buyer consultation where they're explaining all the parts of a real estate transaction, what to expect. They're lining you up with a fantastic lender to make sure that your approval is solid and that you know where your numbers are going to be. And those are not going to change. They're helping you find and consider other properties that maybe you wouldn't have found on your own because we may tweak some little thing. Uh, we can help negotiate for your best interest. We're going to be pulling comps on that property to get an idea what the market value is. An attorney can't help you with that. No, I, I agree with everything you're saying. However, if I'm the average, we're going to say the average real estate agent out there, I've had my license for less than a year. I'm probably working another job. I'm probably doing this part-time. When you look at by numbers, mm -hmm. when you look at by numbers, how many real estate agents are out there, right? That is going to be the real estate agent that you, who provide a concierge service, that do what you're supposed to do with the license, that represent your client's interests, you're a rarity compared to the majority of the right. people out there. We're going to slow down to speed up and be effective, right? So we're going to do that consultation. And I've had buyers skip us or say, no, I don't. I just, I just want to go see the house, right? It's what mm -hmm. you're saying. I just want to go see the house. I've already picked it on Zillow. That is not the value proposition anymore. It used to be part of the value proposition when all the 
you know, homes were in an MLS book and we had to be familiar with them. That's not the value proposition of an agent anymore. But I've had buyers that bought in this recent market that said, that have come back to me and said, I am so sorry that we, I didn't stick with you through this because I bought this house that's a POS and it has all these things wrong with it. You know, because a buyer's agent just sort of slid things under the rug or pushed them through. I'm going to be the first one to tell my buyers I probably wouldn't buy this house. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell them that. And so, and because I know there's another home we can buy that's solid, right? A lot of these first time home buyers don't have the money for the big repairs. So we're going to try to guide them accordingly based on their financial position and so many things. I'm never going to suggest anything or put together any kind of plan for a buyer or a seller until I know their whole situation and what they're trying to accomplish. You just can't do it until you understand where they're at and what their goals are. No, I completely agree with all that. Speaking of listings, we're running out of time. Would you like to uh, Blow ramble through some? it. Here, would you like to do it? There's some good ones in here. So we have 1708 African Violet Court in Trinity. It's a 2004 build, four bedrooms, three bathrooms. It's got a three-car garage. And a pool. And a pool, so you can golf cart around town. It's on a quarter acre. You can't, you can't find stuff like this anymore. So that's up in Trinity, 1708 African Violet Court. Good schools. Uh, we've now got Port Ritchie right around the corner from there. We've got 10636. I can't pronounce that. Isora. Isora Lane. That's with an X. Port Ritchie. Um, this is a beautiful mid-century home. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, priced just at 300000 So it's well under the average price of the sale, median price of sales going on. It's got a Mediterranean courtyard. It's situated in Jasmine Lakes Estates. You definitely want to check this one out if you want to live in Port Ritchie. It is on also quarter acre. Great home, one owner. Moving south, we've got 24248 Painter Drive in Land Lakes. This one is a 1993 home. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, private community. It's got a garage that meets the street. So you don't have to drive as far back. Your home is situated in the back. Your garage is near the front. So it gives you an other layer of privacy. And within that privacy is a pool. A nice pool, too. Beautiful nice pool. big side yard and front yard on that one as well. On the same street. Oh, on the same street. Yeah, same street. We got it, too. This one two, doesn't have a pool. 24219 Painter Drive. This is a three-bedroom, two-bathroom. 1993. Uh, no pool. Great home. Um, we've got 4004 West Land Avenue in South Tampa. With Great. a pool. With a pool. This is near the MacDill Air Force Base. So if you're in the military, you get your private pool oasis here. Uh, 1965 home. This is a great house if you're in the military. And then we have 525 Zanesville Street South, Pasadena. With an in-law suite. With an in-law suite built in for rental. All right. If you want information on these or open houses, 813-377-2775. You can call or text. We'll give you information to these and more. 813-377-2775. We didn't even cover any of the other market data. It looks like that's a next week problem. Next week problem. All right. Love where you live or we're going to fix it. Welcome home. Thank you.